Well, who here likes Shel Silverstein? Anybody? Oh, absolutely. Right down here. We have some Shell fans. Here is one that I like. It's called Hug a War. And it goes like this I will not play at Tug a War. I'd rather play at Hug a War, where everyone hugs instead of tugs, where everyone giggles and rolls on the rug, where everyone kisses and everyone grins and everyone cuddles and everyone wins. How about that, huh? Okay, so here's my question for you. In, in the relationships that you have with other Christians, would you rather play hug a war or tug a war? Just let me know. <laughs> Dip deep, stand deep. You can let me hug a war or tug a war? Mm, hug a war, I think, right? Can we just all assume that for purposes of argument this morning? We'd rather hug than tug? Okay, well, then here's the second question. Um, if hug a war is infinitely more satisfying than tug a war, why in our relationships with other believers in particular, do they often feel like tug a war with like pulling and tension? Whether we're talking about our relationships with members of our immediate family, uh, maybe our, our spouse or our children, or our relationships in our church family, on our, our ministry teams. Why the, why the tension and the tugging instead of the harmony and the hugging? That's, that's the question. And another question is, does it have to be that way? Do we have to experience on an ongoing basis tension with others that we're in close proximity with? And the answer is no. That, that waging hug-a-war instead of tug-a-war in our families and, and in our marriages and with our children in our churches is entirely possible, as we'll see from the scripture today. By the way, my name is Darren, and I'm one of the pastors here at Valley, and we're, we're in a summer series on the Psalms called Cries of the Heart, Psalms for Summer. And to explore this hug or tug question, we're going to look at a very brief psalm. It's Psalm 133. It's only three verses, uh, but it's so vivid that once you hear this psalm, you never forget. It has a way of sinking in and working its way on your heart and mind, and I guarantee you, you will never forget it now that you've, you've heard it. Um, hey, let me also draw your attention to the sermon notes. If you open them up, you will see some fantastic art that Michaela Jones, Pastor's, Pastor uh, Kurt's daughter, did for us. You might have a little trouble orienting it at first, so hold it up until you see Aaron on the right and Herman on the left. And what I want you to do is just look at Michaela's interpretation of Psalm 133 as I read the, the psalm to you. It goes like this. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers, and that includes our sisters too, dwell in unity. Literally in Hebrew, it's Gam Yachad, which is the title of Michaela's artwork that you can see. It, referring back again to unity and, and unitedness, is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. So how can we slacken the rope when we're tugging against each other? How can we play hug-a-war instead of, of tug-a-war? Well, to do so, we have to tell ourselves two truths again and again. And here's the first truth we have to tell ourselves, that for Christians, oneness is a present possession and not a future fantasy. It's a fact, whether we feel it or not. And we'll talk about this, but let me give a little background here. Psalm 133 is part of a collection of psalms that scholars call the Psalms of Ascent. You know the word ascent, it means going up. They were a, a musical playlist 
for the Jewish people who were on the road, literally, they were on the road to Jerusalem for one of the three great festivals that they were commanded to visit Jerusalem to celebrate. So three times a year, the Jews would travel from their towns and their villages to the city of peace, that's Jerusalem, where they would celebrate what God had done in delivering them from Egypt. And they're called the Songs of Ascent going up because Jerusalem was built on kind of a low hill And so you would always go up to Jerusalem, even if you were from whatever direction you came from, you'd always go up to Jerusalem. So this is a special collection of Psalms, and Psalm 133 is one of them. Well, as you can imagine, these journeys were exhilarating. The people loved to go to Jerusalem. They loved to feast and and, and worship God unreservedly, as we learned last week from Pastor Daniel, and as we're practicing in fresh new ways. But... Uh, here's the truth about these wonderful journeys to Jerusalem. They were exhilarating and they were terribly exhausting. Because like with any kind of travel, especially in the ancient world, there were difficulties and inconveniences and definitely so on these pilgrimages. So it was hot during the day. It was cold at night. There were bandits, there were insects making these travelers very tired and not surprisingly testy with one another. And you might have some experience this summer if you did some traveling with your family on the tensions that go along with with travel. Anyway, a scene such as this one might have been experienced. Excuse me, but your mule is kicking up dust in my face. And the other guy turns around and says with some sarcasm, well, I'm sorry for riding so close in front of you. And then the other guy would say, hey, I don't like your tone. And just before things would really start to unravel, their leader would get between them and he'd wrap his arms around them and he'd recite or maybe he'd sing this tehillah, this psalm. And he'd say, oh, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. They don't just dwell together, but they dwell together in deep unitedness and harmony and sympathy and mutual appreciation then he'd go back and forth and he'd look at him. He said, hey, it's like oil on the head, brothers. Running down on Aaron's beard, running down on the collar of his robe. And they'd say, oh, but we look at this and say, what is this all about? Oil, head, beard, robe, what's going on? Well, the psalmist is reminding them of a unique day in their nation's history, of Aaron, the priest's ordination. And he's saying, the psalmist is basically saying to paraphrase, hey, remember when our forefathers trekked out of Egypt, this ragtag bunch, we were together in the wilderness. And remember how all of our tribes uh, were, were differentiated and, and, and disunified, but they were unified. They were brought together. They were integrated through the priestly ministry of Aaron. Well, how did this unification, this coming together come about? How did the many become one? One word, oil. There was an oil event. Aaron got anointed. In fact, I have here from my Jewish friend, Chuck, who I study Hebrew with sometimes, uh, a shofar, a ram's horn, could be used for anointing. And in preparation for uh, the anointing that Moses gave to Aaron, uh, the Lord gave Moses a very, very particular recipe for this anointing oil. And he said, I don't want you to even follow this. This is just for this anointing of the priest. And the Lord said, hey, take the finest spices, liquid myrrh, and of sweet-smelling cinnamon, an aromatic cane, and cassia, and a hint of olive oil, and you shall make of these a sacred anointing oil, blended as by the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. And then on, on this great day in Israel's history, Moses gathered all the people together in front of the the tent of meeting, this miscellaneous, diverse group of men, women, and children gazing at Aaron and Moses in front of the tent of meeting. And then Moses tipped that shofar. He tipped it with that carefully mixed 
olive oil, and, it, and those fragrant contents poured out on Aaron's head. They were just mixed so carefully. And first, it mixed in with his hair and made a, a, a beautiful smell. And then it worked its way down into his uncut beard because he wasn't allowed to cut his beard. So the oil went from head to beard. And then, because of the overflow, it actually permeated his priestly robes. So these three unique entities, head, beard, robe, saturated by the oil of God, connected together, linked, you could say, these separate elements into one. And that's a colorful picture, but, but what's, what's the upshot? Well, there are two significant oil outcomes for ancient Israel. And the first one is this, that all the people became one. This mass group of different people and different tribes with different sensibilities and, and so on. They, they became one. They became a unit. See, Aaron, as the high priest, represented all the people. And as that holy oil worked its way from head to beard to robe to breastplate with all the names of the tribes covered by this oil, it, in a sense, brought them together. It consolidated them, you could say, whether they were slaves or debtors or offenders or outwardly reputable, it took them all and it made them one. And this is really interesting. The, the, the translation we have here says collar, but there's some discussion about this because one old version translates the Hebrew phrase, which here is translated collar, with another word that can refer not just to the upper edge of the garment, but to the lower edge too, the hem. And if that's the case, then we have oil running from head to hem, connecting all these various aspects of the priest's person and garb. But regardless of whether the correct translation is collar or hem, the meaning is the same. It's the oil of God which brings together these separate entities, pictures the unitedness of the people of God. One nation to, 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 to worship, to serve God. Gam yachad, together. Not just dwelling together, but dwelling together in unity, sympathy, Harmony, mutual affection, mutual appreciation. Through Aaron's anointing, this group was unitized. And that's what the psalm pictures, and that's what it proclaims to these pilgrims, and it proclaims it to people like us. Well, that's the first effect that uh, Aaron, the people became one. Well, the second effect is even more staggering. It's that Aaron, the priest, becomes a wonder. That is, he becomes unique among his brethren. This guy that everybody else looked at as just an ordinary dude now becomes a one and only in their sight. This man was set apart to commune with God particularly and to carry out ministry on the people's behalf and to teach the people the Torah of Yahweh and to place incense before God and to help protect the people from sin and impurity, and to function as an intermediary when they stumbled, to offer a series of various sacrifices for the, the, the praise of God and the blessing of the people. In other words, anointing made Aaron a big shot, a big wig, a VIP. Oil made him a wonder. And as an after effect of this oil event, the people could never look at Aaron the same way. They couldn't. They saw him now through a coat of precious oil. He literally glistened, figuratively and literally, in their sight. And so when he walked through the camp, people took notice and they treated him with respect because he was the anointed of God. He was a priest of God. Well, that's verse 2. What's verse 3, which at first is also somewhat of a head-scratcher? It says, again, referring back to gam yachad, unity, unitedness, is like the dew of Hermon, the psalm goes on to say, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. So unity is likened now to mountain dew. 
What's the significance of that? Well, Mount Hermon, and you can see it on Michaela's art on the left, is the highest mountain in Israel, about 9,000 feet. It's in the north, and it was famous for this mysterious night mist, just called here in our translation, dew. And in the Bible, it's a symbol of welcome refreshment for the weary and the hot. In fact, Yahweh compares his own refreshing presence in the lives of his people to do. Hosea 14, 5 says, um, I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. Well, what's going on here? Mount Zion, in contrast to Mount Hermon, uh, remember we said that, that Mount Zion, Jerusalem, was built on a little hill but a low, low compared to Mount Hermon, is one of the lowest mountains in Israel. It's, in the, it's dry, it's arid. And now look again at, at the painting. The psalmist is saying, and Michaela is bringing out, that this pure and mysterious moisture falls from heaven on mighty Mount Hermon, and it streams down, 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 from peak to peak, until finally it rests on Mount Zion And here again, you get this. We have a picture of differentiated ridges, originally differentiated and separate, some big, some small, some high, some low, that are now covered and connected and integrated. They're made one, and they're made one wonderful mountain range by the dew that comes from God out of heaven. This dew that that revives and refreshes and, and irrigates. And again, this is a picture of what, of what God has done in unifying his people, his covenant family, not as a matter of fantasy, but as present fact. He called them out and he consolidated them. Well, let's just look at our own situation here. There's, there's another Israel on pilgrimage today, and it's the people of God. It's those who have have repented and and believed on the name of of Jesus. We're on a pilgrimage too. Jesus says so in Matthew 13, 44, a key discipleship parable for Valley Church. Paul calls us mysteriously, and there's debate on exactly what this means, but in Galatians 6, he calls us the Israel of God. So there's this Israel on the trail, and it's us. And as we know, as we travel along, on this pilgrimage of faith that we kick dust up on each other sometimes. We overheat with one another sometimes. But you know, we can wage hug a war instead of tug a war. We can actually enjoy the blessing of life together now in our marriages, with our children, with our siblings, on our church leadership teams. We can experience that now. And of course, in the life to come at pilgrimage's end, and, and, and here's how we do it. Uh, here, here's how we, 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 we got to tell ourselves again and again that this unity is something we have now because we've had an oil event. We've actually had a greater oil event than even Aaron experienced. Well, before I get to it, let me tell you what the outcomes of the oil event are. Number one, that all believers become a family. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13. I love this. It says, For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, or we could say whether heads, beards, robes, high mountains, medium mountains, low mountains, we were all baptized into one body by one spirit, and we were all given one spirit to drink. And just circle one body. The big point again is that the Spirit covers and connects and integrates all believers into one family. That this spiritual dew of the Holy Spirit, this condensation, brings about this connection of believing molecules, you could say, that adhere together and form a new and complex entity without losing individual individuality. That the Spirit takes a bunch of different people, again, some heads, some beards, some robes, and unites us. He makes us like this new clan, 
this new family, this band as we press on together in this faith pilgrimage. You know, it's shocking to consider that our genetic family won't last, but our oil family lasts forever. One pastor said it this way, our spiritual family, God's family, is going to outlast even your physical family. Physical families don't last. They grow up, they move away, they die. But the spiritual family of God, and we'll call it our oil family, is going to go on and on for all eternity. Well, what's the second oil effect? And I love this. It's not only do the believers become a family, but like Aaron the priest, every believer becomes a phenom, becomes a man, woman, or child, a phenomenal dignity and stature and responsibility under the direction of God, becomes priest-like, becomes like Aaron, becomes a big deal, a bigwig, somebody to whom respect should be shown. Look again at 2 Corinthians 12, 13. Twice Paul uses the adjective all. We were all baptized by the one spirit. We were all given the one spirit to drink. Catch this, not just one special person like Aaron in ancient Israel, but every believing person. Titus 3.5 says much the same thing, that God poured out. He took his shofar and he poured out his Holy Spirit on every believer who's turned to Jesus the King. Not just Aaron Not just King David, not just the prophets, but every person who repents and believes. And I want to just give a little illustration here, and I'm just going to call on Sean and Chanel for a minute and just have you guys stand up just for a second here, and you guys can just stand right here, just kind of make this right, and you can just turn and face your brothers and sisters. And uh, if you don't know Sean and Chanel, you need to meet them. They're wonderful. And uh, they're married. And they've got three kids. And, um, and they love each other. I've seen this. And uh, Sean, I know you love Chanel because in our, as our friendship's grown, I've really seen the love you have for her. But I want you to see her in a new light, okay? Because she is your wife and she bears the image of God, but she doesn't just bear the image of God. See, now she bears the influx of God the inflow of God. Now that she's believed, his spirit has come upon her and you need to see her now no longer as just your wife, no longer as somebody who bears the image of God, but as somebody anointed and part of God's new holy priesthood. So I ask you, my brother, how could you ever dismiss her? How could you ever be insulting to her? How could you ever treat her light or roll your eyes at her? Because this woman right here bears the anointing of God, and so she deserves for all time your love and your highest respect. All right? You guys want to thank them here? All right, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah. First Peter 2, 5, it says, you yourselves are a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So I ask us more broadly, now that we've been anointed by the anointed one, how can we ever be harsh, dismissive, disrespectful, treat lightly those whom God has emptied his horn upon? Our fellow believers deserve our absolute respect and appreciation. That's why God made Moses anoint Aaron publicly. You know, we've got to see other believers through that precious oil. And, and as, as Aaron-like, people of real importance, people who God is calling upon to offer spiritual sacrifices of prayer, to lead others in the ways of God. We need to see each other not just as family, but like we said, as phenoms. People of phenomenal dignity and responsibility before God. But again, beyond just the respect that this shared anointing makes us offer one another, the Holy Spirit also provides resources to actually feel the blessing, experience it deep within this unitedness. And so there's a second truth that we have to tell ourselves. Remember, the first one is uh, um, 
that, again, that, that, that unity is a present possession, not a future fantasy. The second one is this, oops, sorry, went the wrong way, that, that um, this unity is a possession that can be savored and experienced each day of the pilgrimage. We can actually feel it. We can enjoy it. There doesn't have to be any kind of tension, and, and, and there can just be harmony. And here's how we do it. Listen to this. Let me just pay, give you this, too, real quick. Um, there's a really cool house down in Carmel that I visited before. It's called Tor House. And it was built by, by the famous poet Robinson Jeffers. And he built this stone house exactly 100 years ago, or I think it's actually 99 years ago. It was built in 2000, or, or it's going to be 100 years old in another year. But anyway, it's made of stones, and he wrote this poem, and I read these lines, and it really struck me, because he wrote about his own house and about himself, Jeffers wrote, that my fingers had the art to make stone love stone. And indeed, those stones love each other, because that house still stands, a hundred years later, you can, you can call down there and you can visit and get a tour of Tor House. And it just occurred to me, like with Jesus' fingers, when he touches us, when he gets his hands on us, his fingers have the art to make stone love stone. To just deeply enjoy one another and adhere to one another and care for each other and respect one another and applaud for each other and just enjoy each other. What's the role then that we play in this? How, how do we feel the unity that has already found us? And it's just basically one simple action. And it's to choose to let all our interactions match our anointing. It's to, to cultivate a particular peace-promoting habit with power from him who tipped his horn over all his people. And so, brothers and sisters, let's pour out prouse. And you're thinking, what's that? Ephesians 4, 1 through 2 talks about this often obscure, rarely highlighted Christian virtue that is the power to feel the unity that has found us. And he writes about it in the first two verses of chapter 4. He says, I therefore urge you to walk. Remember, this is a pilgrimage that we're on. And walk has the sense of an everyday, ongoing experience. I urge you to walk with all prowse. Well, well what's, what's prowse? Let me give you a quick prouse primer. Prouse is the New Testament's word for gentleness or patient consideration and perfect courtesy that we believers, the oil bearers, extend to other people of faith because we stand in admiration of their anointing by the Holy Spirit. And, and this virtue of prouse is also understood and translated sometimes as humility or politeness and sometimes meekness. Well, who has a claim on our prouse treatment? First, fellow believers deserve our special kindness and ongoing honor because, like we talked about, they bear Aaron-like honor as those anointed by God to serve within his holy priesthood. However, not just believers, unbelievers also deserve our warmest courtesy because they bear the image of God. And the Apostle Paul commands us to show prouse to all people. Well, who's the ideal portrait of Prowse? Here's the Sunday school answer. It's Jesus Christ, of course, who is Prowse personified. He manifested this quality in his earthly life by treating men and women, the high and the low, the young and the old, with equal dignity. You know, Jesus, just like he raised that humble paralytic off the mat, he raised this humble, easily overlooked virtue off the mat off of its disrespect and obscurity, when he himself said, I am Prowse. In Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. But lest we think somehow this 
virtue is inconsistent with firm, strong leadership, notice that in the same verse, Jesus himself commands his hearers to come, take, and learn. So being prowess is definitely consistent with being a firm leader who's in charge of of other people. Jesus, the, the, the world's true king, rode into the rightful city of Jerusalem that was his, and he rode in in unassuming posture, even though he deserved all the world's accolades and glory. And yet, Matthew, quoting Zechariah, said, Behold, your king is coming to you, prowse and mounted on a donkey. Well, who's responsible to pour out prowse? In short, every man, woman, youth, and child who has experienced the prowse of God through Jesus is now privileged to pour out prowse, kind, respectful treatment that's patient towards others. Matthew 10, 8 says, you received without pain, give without pay. Give prowse because you received it from God. How then can believers in various roles and life situations experience prowess? Well, again, as we saw from Ephesians, prowess is for every believer. And let's start with with church and, and ministry leaders. They can practice prowess by using their positions of influence, whether they're elders or deacons or Sunday school leaders or directors of ministries and so on, to build up the weak to help ministry move forward, to restore the wayward, to to just shepherd the people who are under your care. And sometimes when the people under your care blow it, like we all do, prouse is the order of the day. Galatians 6.1 says, if anyone is caught in any transgression, restore him in a spirit of prouse. Leaders are supposed to instruct others in a prouse tone, without argumentation, without harshness. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.24, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, correcting his opponents with prouse. You know, the only time leaders should ever have to to resort to pressure and force is to repel wolves who are ravishing the sheep of Jesus Christ. Other than that, ministry leaders and and, and people and any kind of authority at any level in the local church should be the most prouse and tender and sisterly and brotherly of all the people. That's how the leaders are supposed to be. How about the men? Let's talk to the men for just a minute. We men can practice prouse by honestly accommodating our often greater physical strength to the smaller statures and some of the limitations and and, and idiosyncrasies of of, of others. Because male size and power can be intimidating, men really do have a particular responsibility to be prous with the people around them, starting with their wives and their children. And I I wish I could just preach to you that, that I have secured this virtue, but oh no, I am very prouseless a lot of the time. And I just got to tell you, about a year ago, I was disciplining my children for something. I can't remember what it was. And we were all upstairs, and I really got angry, and I raised my voice, and I, I shouted. And just like mice scattering when the cat gets mad, they all scattered to the four corners of the house. And I sat down, and I felt kind of self-righteous and justified. And then my wife came over to me, and she had a look on her face that I haven't seen since. Ben hadn't seen before, and she just said this. She said, Darren, you are scaring the kids. And immediately I felt this sense of just total conviction. I just sat down on the bed. And I thought, oh, no, man, what have I done? And I just called all the kids to me, and they just kind of crept out of their hiding places with trepidation. I said, come here, guys. And I just said, you know, I'm so sorry. I lost my temper I was way too harsh. And immediately, they're starting to kind of swarm and start to hug. And they start to interject, no, Dad, we were the ones that we were wrong. We were disobedient. We didn't do this. And I said, no, guys, no. I'm the dad. I'm the one responsible to love you and discipline you tenderly and kindly. I was out of line. Please forgive me. And then the hug-a-war started. 
I mean, they were just all over me. Their spirits opened up again. I learned, and, and, uh, and hopefully I will continue to learn. But that's why Paul, understanding the power that we men have to inflict damage on the people we love the most, he wrote this in 1 Timothy 6.11. He said, O man of God, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and prowse. Pursue it. Chase it down the road of your life until it's yours, embedded in your heart and in your characteristic actions. How about women? Well, women can practice prowess in all the ways we just talked about. Gentleness, meekness, humility towards others, using power in a, in a courteous, warm way that uplifts others. But you know, there's, some, there's a way too that the apostle Peter um, says that, that um, he tells his sisters in Christ that there's another way too, that for women in particular, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a prouse and gentle spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. So women, do A and B above, and also like our brother Peter tells us, grow in the beauty that never fades. Grow in that, in that beauty of a, of a proud spirit, a gentle spirit that is courteous and warm and humble and sensitive to the people around you. How about teenagers and children? Is there a special prowse opportunity that is facing you? And the answer is yes. You can practice prowse by showing respect for those around you in a prouseless world, starting with your parents. Ephesians 6 2 says, Treat your parents, literally, the word in Hebrew for honoring is to treat them heavy. Treat your parents like a heavyweight, somebody weighty, important, and significant in your life. Uh, I would encourage you to make eye contact with the people around you. Don't always be looking at your device. Honor and esteem the people around you by engaging them. Proud treatment of your siblings means seeing them as Aaron-like, not just a bother and a nuisance. People unique and called by God to serve him in special ways. You know, that's why First, or Ephesians 4, 1 and 2, it says, I therefore urge you, walk in a manner worthy of the calling, again, with all humility and prowess. Prowess to the highest degree. You know, especially for teens and, and young people, I just would really encourage you, school is starting again, and some of you are in public schools, some of you are in, in, in home schools, whatever your situation, that with any students around you, that you would just never look down on others as unimportant or keep your distance from others, but you would love and include, especially fellow family members, that you wouldn't literally be too cool for school, but you would just welcome in the students around you and love them and, and claim them. Here's a, just a quick story as I close. Um, when I was at Santa Cruz Bible about 10 years ago, this guy, Drew Temple, showed up at my church. And I got to know him a little bit. And he, I found out, worked, just started working at the gym that I used to like to go to. When I would go to this gym, formerly Gold's Gym in Santa Cruz, which sounds kind of funny, I realize. But I would go into this gym and kind of got used to the fact that despite my attempts to kind of engage other people and the staff, very got very little engagement back. And I understood. I wasn't the right age. I didn't look the part. So I was just kind of accustomed to it. But anyway, got to know this guy at church, walk into the gym run one day, and across the, the room at the desk, there's Drew. And I just say, hey, Drew. Kind of quiet, unassuming. And he just goes, hey, Darren, glad you're here. Hey, we talked about getting coffee. When are we going to get that on the calendar? And I just kind of like blew up like a Christmas tree, to get this honor from this guy. And as I was walking towards him, I could see this other young woman working at the counter, kind of looking out of the corner of her eye, thinking, what do these two guys have in common? <laughs> what connects these two? And I thought, I know what connects us. We're oil brothers. We both bear the oil of God. We're siblings. And he's happy to claim me in this public place. He's happy to pull me in and say, I'm one of his own. And I encourage you, if you're a young person, probably the greatest way you can show prowess is saying the people around me, maybe the ones who struggle a little bit socially, they're the ones who get my highest attention and priority. Those are the ones who get my love and my interest. Romans 12, 16 says, don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. 
I want to send you off um, with something that you can look at this week. It's on the last page of your notes. And I call it um, a five-part Proust Pact. And I really encourage you to maybe look at it this week as you, as you spend time with God in the Scripture and just say, if Proust is to become powerful, then Proust must become practical. And here are five ways that the spirit of Proust can become practical and operative in my life now that the oil and the dew has fallen on me. And you make that something that you, you study and pray about this week. Would you join me in prayer? Father, as we've learned from the scripture today, your oil has flowed and your dew has fallen. And we have been anointed and we've even been exalted. Father, we don't deserve the honor that you've paid us by bringing us into your family, indeed even into your priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices and help others. And, but Lord, help us to keep bringing out what already belongs to us, gam yachad, unitedness, oneness, harmony, appreciation, mutual enjoyment, support, respect. Lord, let that characterize each individual. Let that characterize our church in a world that's increasingly prouseless. Let our church be characterized by this wonderful virtue. Thank you that you yourself, Jesus, are prouse when we fail and get proud. That you welcome us back and clean us off and, and anoint us again. So Lord, help that to be our pursuit. Help us to consider the prouse pact and adopt as much as is appropriate for us in our circumstances. And again, we thank you for Jesus, uh, a one and only pilgrim who went not to life and blessing at first, but down to, to death and curse when he went on that cross. And thank you that he rose again and he's ascended and he offers freedom and forgiveness and new life to all who would turn to him in faith. So thank you, Lord, for your word. Continue to instruct us by your spirit. Thank you, as 1 John says, we have an anointing that lasts. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.